What's going on guys, this is Rob. Uh, if you guys enjoy my content, make sure you hit the subscribe button and make sure you hit that little bell so you never miss out on my sexy voice. Okay, so the other day we did a video on uh, Mad Jim Jaspers, uh, too powerful for Marvel movies, too powerful for the MCU. And I think I might move that to Sunday, which means now we get to do it today. But I was sitting here thinking, I was like, if we do that, like which character would we do next? Because it has to be one who's recognizable. I did Mad Jim Jaspers just for the sake of being able to do Mad Jim Jaspers. But we're like, we're also trying to make sure we reach like a large audience of people, right? Because like we're trying to grow the channel. So my thought was like, which character would we do? And then it dawned on me. There were two characters that I wanted to do. But this one that I want to do here, I think is cool basically like God Thor or Rune King Thor. Now, Rune King Thor is crazy powerful for like two pages. And it's, and well, not really even two pages. He's actually powerful for the rest of the story for Thor disassembled. Okay, so for those of you guys who are new to comics, wind the clock back to like 2004, 2005, right? So Marvel is like, okay, all these characters are super OP and everything's really, really powerful and all that kind of stuff. So Marvel does a whole bunch of different things. The first thing they do is they depower 98% of the mutant population, right? Like take their powers away. That happens in a story with the Scarlet Witch called House of where she takes away 98% of the mutant population's power. She literally says no more mutants and they all lose their abilities. Now from there, Marvel starts like taking away characters because they're going into the events of Civil War. The problem with Civil War is that it's, it's a fight among the superhero community. But if Thor was there or if like the Incredible Hulk was there, then whatever side they were on would basically win. And so in this instance, Marvel says, okay, we're going to write Planet Hulk and we're going to write Hulk out of the picture. So like Greg Pak writes that story, the Incredible Hulk ends up on another planet sent there by the Illuminati. And then they, they turn to Thor. And so so what we end up getting is Thor disassembled. We basically get the events of Thor Ragnarok, which is kind of cool. Most people know what goes on with the Thor Ragnarok story. It's basically this idea that like Loki sets in motion a series of events that ultimately leads to like an invasion of Asgard. Now Odin is dead by this point, and so he's just a disembodied corporeal essence called the Odin Force. And he appears to Thor for a little while, but Thor tries his best to, to face off, you know, to defeat the forces of Loki, and he gets absolutely decimated, right? He gets like absolutely wrecked. And so what ends up happening is Thor is, is you know, he's defeated, he's like, like on his last leg, he ends up calling in the help of Captain America and Iron Man, and then the fight is joined by Beta Ray Bill, who's actually the first person to lift the hammer of Thor. Beta Ray Bill fans, you don't find a whole lot of them, but they are fiercely loyal to Beta Ray Bill. It's crazy. And like Thor fans love him too. He's a Corbinite. He's like the protector of his people, more or less. And like they're making their way through the solar system and like Nick Fury and S.H.I.E.L.D. pick up on what's going on. So they're like, Thor, go check that out. Thor gets there. Beta Ray Bill beats the hell out of him and then takes his hammer. It's, it's, it's crazy. But anyway, so with the defeat of Loki coming from like Beta Ray Bill, Captain America, Iron Man, and Thor, Thor. From there, the question becomes like, how do like like how could this have happened? And, and it's Thor's search for knowledge, right? So Thor is met with the Odin Force. Those of you guys who don't know, the Odin Force is basically just the life energies of Odin combined with the life energies of his brothers Vili and V. And that's basically it. It's Marvel's way of just basically being able to say like, we need a story where where, Thor, where like Odin can do something that he can't normally do. And the question is like, well, how? It's like, well, I don't know. Odin Force. It's like the Speed Force from the Flash, right? You know, like I ain't got to explain. Sh so like it's, it's it's one of those crazy things when it comes to Marvel comics. And so so with with the Odin Force kind of being like disembodied, it guides Thor on this spiritual journey. And what the Odin Force tells him is that in the early days of Odin's rise to power, he had to sacrifice an eye to the Well of Mimir, I think it is, in order to gain like vast amounts of knowledge. But the question is, is Thor willing to do that? Not only that, all Thor is going to gain is the knowledge Odin had, the, the same kind of power Odin had. The question is, does Thor want the same knowledge and power of Odin, or does he want more? And so the, the idea is like Thor wants more. He wants the full totality of everything that's going on. And so what ends up happening is Thor sacrifices both of his eyes and he essentially gets like twice as much power as odin has he wields what's called the thor force but it's basically the odin force with the thor name but like at that point in time he essentially becomes god like he's omniscient and and like it's insane how much power he has because imagine odin being twice as strong as he normally is and odin's powerful as hell i mean odin like like he, he put the like he put the hurt on 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 galactus dude there's this like amazing scene dude i can't remember, I, I can't remember what it's, it's not j michael straczynski's thor it's somebody else's thor run i can't remember what it is in the first story arc odin fights off against fights against Galactus and Galactus is like dude I'm so tired of Asgardians like I hate these things like like Odin like headbutts the hell out of out of Galactus and I'm pretty sure like cracks his helmet and like Galactus is like Asgardians you bore me and like like dude Odin puts the hurt on him but he uses so much energy that he has to like power down and go into the Odin into the Odin sleep but like he stands toe to toe against Galactus which is pretty damn impressive uh but still like imagine Odin being like twice as powerful like twice that level of power that he 
had in his fight against Galactus, and that's where Thor is. And so Thor is just like this, uh, this like insanely powerful, omnipotent being. And so what he does is he he gains all this knowledge, and he ends up realizing that like everything that's been going on with the events of Ragnarok are a cycle. It's a cyclical pattern, and Odin broke the pattern. That by by whatever manner and whatever means, which Marvel teased the ideas in what was it? It was in the last days of Loki uh, during the events leading up to Secret Wars. Marvel teased the idea that it was actually the Beyonders, but there was this group out there that were just called the ones who sit above in shadow. And we didn't really know anything about them. We didn't really know where they came from or, or, or how they functioned. All we knew is that whenever Asgardians saw them, they looked like Asgardians. So it's, it's the Galactus principle, right? Like, like in the trial of Reed Richards, Marvel established that Galactus appears as whatever race lives on the planet that he's attacking. So like if Galactus shows up to the scroll planet, he'll look like a scroll. If he shows up to earth, he'll look human. If he shows up on the Kree home world, he'll look like a Kree. It's just the mirror effect. And that's how the, the ones who sit above in shadow work. But the way this happened is that somehow they came into existence and then eventually Asgard came into existence and then the first Ragnarok happened. And when it did, the ones who sit above in shadow fed off all the life energy let off by the Asgardians when they all died. And then all the Asgardians came back into existence again, Asgard was recreated and they continued on until Ragnarok happened and the cycle repeated itself over and over and over again. And this had happened countless times. It had happened since like the dawn of the universe or maybe even before. And so when Thor realizes that, he's like, okay, so we have to destroy the ones who sit above in shadow because his idea is in every single instance of Thor or of, of Asgard's creation and its lifespan before the events of you know that that telling of the story what had happened was that Thor had just lived his life on Asgard and he had just been the Thor of traditional Norwegian mythos but then in turn Odin broke the cycle and Odin said okay the only way to really defeat the ones who sit above in shadow is to do something different so that's one of the reasons he cast Thor down to earth also because he was kind of a dick when he was younger but like he cast him down to earth and said you're gonna go live with the earthlings and you're gonna gain a tried and true understanding of what like right and wrong is good and evil and all that kind of good stuff and so when when all that happened he basically became the Thor that we all know and love and then returned to Asgard and that set in motion where he is at the time of that story and so from there he's just kind of like well we have to destroy the ones who sit above in shadow and so using his hammer and using like the full power of the runes which basically make him god he smashes the tree of Idrisil like completely shatters the tree like after confronting the ones who sit above in shadow and in doing so destroys them all and it's absolutely insane because if what Marvel says is true if what Marvel says is that the ones who sit above in shadow were the Beyonders if the events of the last days of Loki are, are accurate and the ones who sit above in shadow were the Beyonders, then by virtue of being the Rune King, Thor was at least presumably powerful enough to like frighten the Beyonders and send them running away. And so it's just kind of like, that's pretty damn powerful, especially when you consider the power, the, the Beyonders were powerful enough to like annihilate the Living Tribunal. Now, I don't think it means that Rune King Thor is on par with the Living Tribunal, but still like it's a pretty crazy display of power. And that would never work in the Marvel Cinematic Universe because what happens when you have a version of Thor's character who's basically Rune King? You can make that argument that he's kind of that level right now but he's not like he's he's thor with like the odin force so like he's half as powerful as he would be if he had like the the full power of the runes and if he was like rune king thor but if he were like full on rune king thor where he's like omniscient and like omnipotent and basically like indestructible how do you make a movie with that like who would you have him fight i guess maybe you could have him fight galactus but like you're talking about a character who's nigh unstoppable on like a universal level and so at that point then it's like like who the hell's he gonna fight you, you can't do a story like that and even if you could you'd be talking about a level of power between between two beings that's easily enough to destroy entire planets or solar systems, even potential galaxies, possibly even fracture the fabric of the universe itself, or send shockwaves through it that would impact things on like an insane level. I mean, imagine that. Like Thor goes to smash his hammer on some villain, it knocks them back and like sends ripples through the universe. And when I say ripples, I mean, you can see the fabric of the universe move. Like like that that kind of stuff would be crazy. I mean, that level of power would be bonkers in, in the movies. And even the comics just stretches the limits of credulity because you would think with someone rising to be that powerful, the Living Tribunal would step in but i guess it wouldn't because it's not like there's two versions of thor who are rune king running around out there so i guess it, it stands you know it, it stands to reason it could it could happen but still like you can't do a version of that character in the marvel cinematic universe because he's just too powerful and you wouldn't really have anybody he could fight i mean if you guys think thanos in the mcu with with that power of the infinity gauntlet is powerful i mean he is but like imagine thanos with the infinity gauntlet in the marvel cinematic universe fighting rune king thor like the power he had in the comics it'd be no contest because in the mcu thanos is a lot weaker with the infinity gauntlet than he is in the comics and the comics it was insane like it was it was nuts the kind of power he had it was crazy stuff like i mean sure he used the reality stone and he messed up like drax the destroyer and then he messed with uh with mantis and so on and so forth but like imagine that like during the fight with thanos on on titan or whatever that moon was that like iron man goes to attack him and he just turns him into like a pile of iron man toys like that's the kind of stuff you saw in the events of like the infinity gauntlet story it was ridiculous like the, the power he possessed but still like 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 rune king thor would be absolutely bonkers like it would be an insane level of power i would argue he could probably he could rival King Hyperion.
Hyperion, from the universe where King Hyperion destroyed all the cosmic entities and all the superheroes. Like, I'd say he, he could probably be that powerful. But even then, it's not consistent, because, like, King Hyperion destroyed Galactus and, like, all the cosmic entities in his own universe, and then gets beat by, like, Blue Marvel. Like, it doesn't really make any sense. I mean, Blue Marvel's cool, Adam Brashear's pretty badass, and, like, he's an absolute hoss. Man, Blue Marvel. Dude, I really want to see Adam Brashear in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. I wonder who would play him. If Idris Elba wasn't playing Heimdall, I'd say make him Blue Marvel. Dude, he'd be an amazing Adam Brashear. He'd be, man, like, imagine, dude, Adam Brashear, dude, I would love to see that. Like, that, that'd have been cool to have, like, an Infinity Gauntlet, right? Like, in the Infinity War movie, like, Thanos is about to snap his fingers, Blue Marvel just, like, races in, takes the gauntlet, and he's like, you're done, and then just leaves, and Thanos is just like, what? And then he just flies back and just beats the hell out of, dude, Blue Marvel would, uh, would absolutely thrash Thanos from, like, the Marvel Cinematic Universe. It, it would, it would be, it'd be like child's play. But yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm, I, anyway, we're going off on a tangent. We're going off on a, on a, on a thing. Rune King Thor. You cannot put him in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Just too damn powerful. It's just, it's, it just doesn't work. Just way, way too extreme. Either that or you would have to nerf the hell out of him. You have to make him a whole lot weaker and that's just not going to fly. But with that being said, guys, we're going to bring this video to an end. If you are new here to Comments Explained, make sure you guys hit the sub button to become part of the Rob Corps. If you guys enjoyed this video, make sure you drop a like and yeah, I will catch you all later. Peace.